Hello, and welcome to Scandinavia House Online and to this webinar, The Teacher's Protest with John Seal and Eric Brockstead. I would like everyone, uh, I would like to remind everyone to please visit scandinavia.org for all of the programs that we're offering uh, this summer. Um, and if you haven't seen The Teacher's Protest yet, the film, uh, you can find, it is screening until July 23rd and information is located on our website. Uh, we are currently adding more programming for the next couple of months and through the fall season. Um, I'd like to introduce John Seal, who is the director and producer of the film, The Teacher's Protest, and is a teacher himself with over 30 years of classroom experience and has published a number of educational books and is a, and is a filmmaker working in both documentary and fiction. Um, and also joining us today is Eric Brockstead, has a keen interest in the Norwegian occupation years. His father, grandfather, and uncle were each arrested by the Germans during the war at different times for different reason, and has given presentations to a wide variety of audience wide variety of audiences telling the, these stories. He is particularly enthusiastic about the teacher's protest because it does such a good job of putting together his grandfather's experience into context and bringing this important story to a much broader audience. Uh, before I start, I would like to encourage all the audience members, if they have questions, to please put them in the chat box below. I'm happy to read them um, throughout the, today's webinar. Um, but I will start off with a few questions first, just to get the conversation going. Uh, first one is for John. Um, can you tell us when and how you first came across the teacher's protest story and how did the film come about? It's not one of the most known facets of uh, history or World War II history at this time. So it's very interesting uh, how you came across this. Yeah, I mean, that's, I think that's a very, very good point. It's a very little, little known story. So um, from my own personal point of view, um, when I was uh, 19, which is, believe it or not, it was a few years ago now, um, I worked in Norway and I worked on a farm. And um, I went back about 10, five, 10 years later, I can't remember exactly when, to, to visit the farm. And uh, I ended up, for had some time in Oslo and I went to the Resistance Museum in Oslo and um, I came across this little exhibition at the end of the Resistance Muse uh, Museum about this teacher's protest and I was really amazed and taken aback because I was a teacher myself by this time. I was really interested in history and I had never heard this story before. It was completely something totally, totally new. And it sort of just sparked something in me. And it was one of those stories that just would not go away. And many, many, many years later, um, I made a sort of decision, having tried various routes with it, that I, I thought this might make an interesting, interesting documentary. And so about between three and four years ago, I made the decision, right, that's it. We're really going to try and, and, and make a documentary. And I mean, I'll, I'll talk more about this later, but I had a lot of very good fortune. First of all, uh, one of the first people that I contacted was Eric. And uh, he was able to kind of fill me in on his grandfather's story. And I was able to find out a little bit, a little bit about that. Then also, um, we had... Um, I was very fortunate in that the NUT, which is the National Union of Teachers in, in England, uh, agreed to give me a, a, sm a smallish sum of money, about five or six hundred pounds, which just was enough for me to go to Norway and start interviewing people. And um, what I found is when I met people who were involved in the protest and interviewed them, they were amazing and so um, generous in the telling and sharing of their stories. And of course, as often happens in this kind of situation, one interviewee would lead to another, would lead to another. And through o over a period of three years or so, I was able to kind of uncover, uncover the story. And then um, we also had some good luck in that we were supported. Um, uh, we had some finance from the Norwegian Teachers Union, uh, which meant we could um, afford to hire some actors and so on. And also then later, in fact, we were very fortunate to get some funding from Education International, which meant that the film was then able to be translated into, into three or four different languages. So that's 
helped its kind of international international release. So it's a long, long old journey as these things as these things often are. <laughs> Before we get into the, the story itself, I was also uh, struck by the, 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 the visual uh, presentation of, of the film. Um, I found the, the, the drawings in the film very striking. Um, can you tell us about the drawings themselves and the artists behind them? Yeah, they're, they're amazing, aren't they? They're incredible. Yeah. Um, the drawings, um, I, had, I, I had a lot of interviews a lot of interesting interviews and some footage of Shirkinez and some footage of Beiska. Uh, and I knew that we had a really good story here. Um, and then I came across in some books, just sort of prints of one or two, I think it's about well, maybe three or four of drawings uh, by an artist called Herlov Ullmann. And uh, I was really struck by how incredible they were. And I sort of thought, if only I could find some more of these, I'm sure there's a way we could use these and really give the film something special. Um, so I just did that thing where you get on the internet and I thought, well, okay, he's bound to have, I don't know, a son or a daughter somewhere. So I did a bit of Googling and I, I came up with the name of Arna Ullmann, who was a guy who seemed to be about the right kind of age to be his son and came from the right, the right town, Lungdal, in the south of Norway. So I just emailed Arna and nothing happened for a couple of weeks. And then I got this amazing email back from Arna saying, yes, I'm, I'm Helo's son. I'm really interested in what you're doing. Come out to Norway and meet me. Come and stay, come and stay with me. So, you know, without, as quickly as I could, I got on a plane and I flew out to Norway and I went to look and was met by Arna, um, who was a fantastic guy. Mm. And he took me to his, his farm, which actually was the farm that his father had also lived in. Um, and we, I remember very clearly walking across this kind of courtyard to a barn. We went in the barn and he converted the top of this barn into like a studio. So he took me up to this really nice studio actually and sat down, he sat behind a desk and uh, really without saying much at all, he sort of went underneath the desk and, and pulled out this huge brown folder of paper and put it on the desk and opened it up. And there were, I suppose, between 50 and 60 of Herlov's original drawings. Um, they were drawn on bits of old card, bits of paper, bits of newspaper, anything that Herlov could get his hands on. And I said, yeah, you can take or as many photos as you want you, and you can use those you can use those illustrations in the film and I knew then as soon as we had those illustrations then I knew we had a film I really knew we had a film and and I suppose I don't know how many times I've looked at them because obviously when you're editing something you look at them all <laughs> and I never never get bored of them I never it never ceases to amaze me that these drawings were done in the most terrible conditions you know terrible minus 10, minus 15, awful conditions. Um, and there's something incredible that this guy, he didn't just draw because it was, you know, interesting or a pastime. He drew because that's how he, how he lived. That's how he expressed himself. That was him. And that was his way of survival. And I think, I think that comes across in the drawing so strongly. Um, so yeah, that was a really, getting those drawings was an amazing, amazing moment, actually. How did they survive? Did the, the, why weren't they confiscated or was there a story? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I don't know the details. He, he hid them. Mm. He worked on them in secret. Although at the same time, we have to remember that when the teachers were finally imprisoned in Sheikh mm. um, the they were not, under the guard of the SS anymore. They were under the guard of the Wehrmacht and the soldiers that guarded them tended to be those who were not able to be sent out to the front. So it was not such a strict regime as it had been in Plini and Jorstamon. Um, so I think, in fact, I did hear a story, um, in fact, Arna told me that his father was asked, the, the German officers, the Nazi officers asked his father to do portraits of them 
Mm. And I think he, he did one or two, but then he said after that, he didn't, he, 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 he always managed to get out of that. He didn't want to do any more of those. So, um, so yeah, I think probably a mixture of things, partly hiding them, partly uh, a slightly less strict regime. And also, obviously, you know, they were vitally important to him to, to the extent that he made sure that when he did finally come back, he, he brought them with him. And because of those images, is that how you made the decision to shoot, uh, make the film sort of in the, the more historical yellow, you know, old age yeah. type of feel? Yeah, yeah. So, that was, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. I, yeah, that, that was so once like, they, they had such a strong visual style, right. then we thought that would be really interesting, obviously, to make that the visual style. And then we kind of came across this idea of could we animate them and what would that what would we do? What would that look like if we if we did this animation? And we came up with a quite quite an involved technical process, but nonetheless one that worked quite well. And we did a, a kind of test of this. There's a sequence uh, which you may remember in the film uh, when they are at Grini with um, the, uh, the 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 Nazi officer Kunza. And there's a short section there. And we did that first of all as a trial, which is about a two or three minute trial. Mm -hmm. And we showed it to sort of various test audiences and people said, yeah, that's really interesting, that, that, that works. And it kind of shouldn't, it, it's not, you know, it's you know, animation. When you sort of think animation and prison camps and right. Second World War documentaries, it kind of shouldn't work. But, right. but it seems to be something that audiences um, find quite compelling. And how was it done? Did you actually shoot the actors first and then animate them in post-production or? Yeah, so um, it's basically what we did is, obviously some of the drawings are just, we, well, we use a lot of hair, hair loss drawings, just, to, you know, they speak for themselves, they don't need any right. attitude. But there are some where we wanted some kind of live dramatic action. So what we did is we took, um, often parts, bits of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the drawing and use those as background. And then we used actors uh, for the animation. And the way that we did that is we shot actors in costume, etc., against a green screen. Okay. okay. Um, and then when you shoot against a green screen, I'm sure most people are familiar with that, you can then substitute the green screen for something else. So in this case, we would substitute it for maybe bits of close-ups from Hellos drawings or backgrounds of Hellos drawing. Um, and then we were able to kind of invent this process, which was able to put the actors into a, a drawn, uh, a drawn, uh, to, to a drawn animation, um, and uh, and and that. So that's how we ended up with those those sequences so in in actual fact that the what was nice is that the, the drawings then literally came to life it literally came to life very interesting um and were there any stories that you would have liked to have told but you were just you just ran out due to time constraints uh, that you would like to share now and eric yeah. I'm sure you have a lot of stories as well if you would like to join yeah in. that's a great question it's really i mean <laughs> filmmaking is about two things really it's about what you decide to put in and what you decide to leave out and those questions are just massive <laughs> questions and and yeah there were so so many difficult decisions some amazing stories that just couldn't make the film uh one area that i i, I still kind of struggle with really which we don't touch on is because it just felt like it wasn't the teacher's story but at the same time as the teachers were imprisoned and arrested, there were a huge amount of Russian prisoners who were um, in the north of Norway and they were treated abominably. They, they were treated far worse than the teachers, far more of them died. Um, and uh, they, 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 were, they, they had a really awful time. Um, and they didn't, as far as the teacher's story is concerned, they didn't have direct relevance to that, but they, they were, in the same area, and many of them did show, particularly when the teachers first arrived, great kindness to the teachers. So we, that was an area that we just decided in the end not to sort of follow that particular route of the story. And I, I kind of feel that that's a mistake. I think maybe we should have just been alluded a little bit more to that. Um, 
we try to allude to the role of the women's uh, women in the protest which was massively important women, women teachers um, and then there were individual stories so for example um, i interviewed uh, one lady called Cecil Sildness uh, in Chiaknaz and she did this most amazing interview about what happened at the end of the war so i expect a lot of people involved or a lot of people listening will know this um, when the Nazis retreated, they burnt Finnmark to the ground. Literally, they burnt every house as they retreated. And so Shirkanez was, as a town, was burnt to the ground. And Cecil told this terrible story about, as a young child, having to leave in a hurry the house. Mm. And then they, together with a lot of people from Shirkanez, they went and hid in caves uh, for a, a, a number of weeks and months. And eventually, um, they heard these kind of knocking at the entrances to the cave and lots of noise. They thought it was Nazi soldiers, and in fact, it was the Russian soldiers come to liberate them. Mm -hmm. um, and so Sissel said that then, the, you know, they obviously when they liberated, the most amazing feeling. And they came out of the caves, went back to the town, and of course, as they came to the town, the whole town was razed to the ground. The whole town was burned. And she talked about going to her house and the house being completely burnt. And um, the, the cellar was still obviously there. And she went down in the cellar and she talked about finding a, 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 one of her dolls mm. in, the, in the cellar, you know. So there was kind of those amazing, terrible experiences and amazing individual stories that in the brutal world of the film, because this was like in 1945 and not in, uh, in the t 1942 at the time of teachers' protest, it just didn't fit into the story. And so we, you know, we had to leave those out. So, so yeah, I mean, you, the story has huge tentacles that stretch out in all kinds of directions. Right. And right. Um, you make a call about what you're going to leave, put in and what you're, what you're going to leave out and, and you do your best. And, uh, to find your way through it without without sort of confusing your audience too much right. Uh, right. you have to be aware of you know your audience has got to follow this exactly uh, so these are these are dif difficult questions you're never sure if you get them right of course and eric do you want to talk about your family's stories now sure uh, uh greetings from the Oregon coast. Uh, I've broken out of the city, Portland, to spend the weekend at Camp Nidaros, the Sons of Norway language camp on the Oregon coast where I went and my kids have gone. It's shut down, but we're spending the weekend there. And I drove my pickup down a little ways down the highway and I'm in a parking lot with a strong, uh, strong enough signal. <laughs> and uh, my grandfather was one of these teachers and my I don't know how I knew the story. He didn't tell it to me. Uh, I didn't speak Norwegian then, and he didn't speak much English. And the last time I saw him, I was 12. Uh, but I remember at the age of 17, coming across a book of various examples of nonviolence resistance uh, around the world. And there was a big section about Gandhi and a small section about the Norwegian teachers. And I, I knew that my grandfather was one of those teachers, uh, but it, my grandfather's particular story became a lot more uh, alive to me when around the turn of the century, my father kind of offhandedly said, oh, by the way, I have the diary that your grandfather kept when uh, he was imprisoned in Shirkines in the summer of 42. And uh, I think this was kind of in the same way that the uh, artist John Seal was talking about, was able to keep his artwork. My grandfather kept a diary and I didn't know about this diary and I was incredulous. I was, uh, you know, uh, why didn't you tell me about this until now? This is a big deal. I, I would love to get to know my grandfather better. And my father uh, said, well, you know, it's not very interesting. It's very repetitive. He talks about being hungry, his anxiety. Uh, it's kind of depressing. I don't think it's very interesting. And I disabused him mm. of that notion and got his 
uh, I couldn't read my grandfather's writing. He also had a, uh, to me, impenetrable script, and it was all Ninosh instead of Bulkmal, which I speak, and he was a Ninosh guy. Um, but my grandfather did, I mean, my father did uh, uh, translate, and we worked on it together, and he did transcribe and uh, uh, translate it into English. And this has been uh, an important family document. And it was only later that I realized the obvious, which was uh, my grandfather's uh, description of his time that summer was all too similar to the 13 months my father spent uh, in Grini when he was 22 years old. He was arrested in Oslo and uh, uh, was incarcerated. And, uh, you know, uh, it, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a time he really liked to think about that much. He would talk about it, but it, just, it was just too similar. So, uh, but he, he overcame that and, and this diary was translated into English. And then John stumbled across it somehow. And uh, we had a Skype call about this time uh, of the year, four years ago. And uh, he told me about his plans for this film. Nice. I do have a question from the audience. Uh, where did it go? Sorry. Um, one second, I just have to go up. Oh. Oh. One. All right. Uh, Christina asked, uh, did you consult the Norwegian government uh, resources and were they helpful? And also, uh, I'll ask the second question because it goes on with another one of my questions. So had, did you ask the Norwegian government resources? Uh, uh, so uh, there was the Norwegian um, National Library. It was very helpful. Um, not the Norwegian government directly, but the Norwegian National Library was very helpful for resources. Um, the Norwegian Resistance Museum in Oslo was very helpful and very supportive. Udanningsforbundet the uh, Norwegian Teachers Union, they were, they were, both, they were very supportive. And also uh, there was a fund called School of Frontens Fund, uh, which was actually incidentally set up by the teachers, uh, which helped, was very helpful. Um, we used a lot of, um, as you obviously in the film, archive footage. Mm -hmm. um, the archive footage came from several sources. Um, the, um, the main source was the Norwegian state Broadcasters NRK, but but to be fair, we had to pay a lot of money for that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so we we had uh, we had various help from different organisations, different organisations within Norway. And as I said uh, a moment ago, you know, it, it was incredible how um, supportive everybody was who we approached about doing this, which I think was quite interesting because um, you know, as as you can hear I'm an English guy um, and I, there, there you know there was a sense of kind of this or I did think would there be a sense of you know somebody coming in from the outside and and kind of telling our story right. how would that be welcome right um, and I was actually amazed by how open people were and uh, and willing to share and I think well, well, I don't think what I have been told by a lot of people is that um, in a way they were surprised that there would be such a huge international interest in the story. This is a sort of a story that is kind of known in Norway and always thought of as a as a local Norwegian story. And I don't think they thought um, that it would have such a huge international interest. And I suppose the fact that uh, I'm from another country might have might have helped uh, in that sharing of it as an international story. Uh, right. Sometimes you can bring a kind of a sort of um, a slightly different perspective, a naive perspective in some ways. Right. Right. Uh, if it, if it's not your country, if it's not your culture. Right. Um, but I was always, you know, I would like to stress, I'm always aware that I am telling somebody else's story. Right. It's a great. It's an incredible honour and privilege as a documentary filmmaker when somebody tells you that story their story and uh, you have a you also have a, a very a huge and very important uh, responsibility to tell that story as right. clearly and honestly as you can right 
So this will go into Christina's second question. Um, uh, do you know if the teachers had any organized coordination with the Norwegian resistance movement or any other questions or did they appeal to Sweden for any help? Eric, would you like to talk about that, about the... the well, that's a, the Sweden thing is, is complicated and there's different perspectives on it, but certainly as the war went on, there was more and more coordination and people would use that as an escape route to England or away when the heat got too, too, too hot. Uh, but uh, in terms of coordination with the, with the various sorts of uh, military resistance, um, I don't know too much about that. I do know that there was smuggling and resistance took so many forms. And that's one of the things that I like about this film is that it shows this nonviolent form and on the other extreme, there were the famous stories that are much well, more well known about the heavy water. Uh, there's a film about Max Manus, who is a famous saboteur who did dramatic actions like that. But again, resistance took so many forms uh, in different ways, organized, disorganized. And some of the ways uh, that the teachers coordinated with other uh, uh, organizations and other people were through communications smuggling of messages and my grandfather in his diaries talks about uh resistance leaders getting messages to the teachers saying that they're working on their behalf to get them free and uh you know when that message got to the teachers that uplifted their spirits um in addition the local local people in uh Shikinesk, at great risk to themselves smuggled food into the teachers a uh, salmon sometimes some sugar, some milk, these things would go through and uh, they were tremendously appreciated by the teachers. And in fact, uh, I guess as an aside, I'll just say that as John said, uh, uh, most of the towns in Finlock were burned to the ground and the teachers came together and published a book uh, shortly after the war called Shirken Nesperbe and all the proceeds from that book went to support the community of Kierkenes, which was devastated. And so the teachers gave back a little bit to acknowledge their appreciation for uh, what the local people did on their behalf. There's a um, couple of things to add. Um, the, the, um, you have to remember that the, there was huge support in Norway for the teachers' cause, so much so that a quarter of a million protest letters were written by parents, you know, huge numbers given that Norway is a small population anyway. Um, and so the teachers' calls and the teachers' actions was seen by the resistance as being really, really important for the kind of morale of the country. And they were very, very clear that they wanted the teachers to hold out as long as they did because it was causing such problems to, to Quisling. So there was some communication with my Lord and the resistance movement. And also um, in terms of the um, links with Sweden, there were many people who escaped across to Sweden. Of course, several Norwegian Jews escaped through that route as well to Sweden. Um, incidentally, if Christina is interested in that particular story, there's a very good book um, called In Another Man's Shoes in another man's shoes um, and I the na name of the author is escaping me at the moment but um, it tells the story of a guy who was he wasn't involved in the teachers protest but he was actually a teacher he then became involved in the resistance and it tells of his escape from Norway through to Sweden and how he did that so if you're interested in that area I do recommend that book I'm sorry I can't remember the name of the name is called. just i looked it up his name is sven somme that's it sven somme yeah um, it's a great story actually really interesting um and then uh davi was asking uh when you're preparing for the film um did you have any opportunity to talk to any of the students at that time um so we had um the teachers themselves, when we, when, we, when we did the interviews, the teachers themselves, uh, there were no surviving teachers. I never found any surviving teachers. Sadly, from that point of view, I was just too late. However, um, 
all of the uh, interviews in the film are in are um, were tend to be the children of the teachers or uh, students of the teachers. So they had first-hand experience. And um, if you've not seen the film yet, um, I think it's incredibly well. I every time I see it, I'm still moved by it. When you hear somebody in their 80s, you know, uh, in Sigurd's case, I think he's 83, um, talking about his father's arrest and remembering, you know, he was a 12 boy and his father being being arrested and taken taken away, and then talking about his father returning. There is something incredibly uh, human and incredibly moving about somebody who's been through a lot of life themselves, remembering their father as they were when they were a child. Uh, it's, it's, it gives an incredible perspective on things. Um, so yeah, the, um, the, the, most of the interviewees, as I say, were either children of the teachers or, or uh, were, were students at the schools. And then we just had a comment from uh, Tracy. Um, She's a math teacher, but always liked history. And this is the first time hearing about the teacher strike in Norway. Um, there's so much history that's been untold, and she's, it's very sad to her. Um, so it was just a comment. And then uh, Joy is asking if the grandfather's diary is available on the internet or otherwise for others to read. Eric. Yes, uh, it was. Uh on a different website, my dad put it up there, but then that the Norwegian website went uh, dark a few years ago, and now it is up on John's website for the okay. movie, The Teacher's Protest. So if you go there and you click through, he's got a section about stories. Let and- me... uh, History, the history section, yeah. One of the stories there. So I'm glad that it has a- oh. It's a fascinating read, I have to say. It really is an amazing read. Sorry, where was it under histories? Under yes, in, there's a history page, and oh. then there's the, the diaries in that history page. Then I'm putting the link in the chat section right now for right. everyone. Okay. Um, and then I think that was all the questions that I had. Um, I was curious about were there any stories uh, that you were told about the teachers actually signing um, the, and, and, and joining, not joining the Nazis, but signing uh, the proclamation and what happened to them uh, during and after the war? Right. Okay. So there were um, a, a number of teachers, particularly at Greeny, um, who signed. Um, they, they weren't in the majority, but there were a number of them who did. And um, one thing that I was told frequently and which um, uh, was written about later was that there was a feeling that these teachers should be blamed for signing. That, that, you know, it was terrible, hard conditions. It was a terrible, terrible right. um, thing that they had to endure. And as Kjell Anna uh, who, who puts it, um, in the film, you know, some of them collapsed, some of them did collapse. Oh. So there wasn't a, a feeling that they should be, that they should be uh, ostracized or punished for that. There was always an attempt to understand right. that that was the case. And the question about after the war is an interesting one more generally, I think, um, because uh, I think there was very much a, a feeling that, um, after the war in Norway, and I think this is the case in, in most European countries and perhaps to America, um, was that, you know, they didn't really want to look back. Right. Didn't want to tell these stories. They wanted to move forward. They wanted to, uh, you know, their towns were wrecked. They were building a new world mm -hmm. and they didn't really want to look back. And particularly in Norway, which as you've, you know, kind of mentioned earlier, Carl, it was a, was a, a country where there were people who were involved as Nazi sympathizers. Right. You know, they, it was a country that was, to some extent was, there was a division within that country and it didn't really help healing if that was kind of raked over, I suppose. Right. So a lot of the um, people that I interviewed said that their fathers, as it tended to be, uh, who were, as they were the ones arrested, they didn't talk about 
those experiences. They just wouldn't talk about them. And right. I mean, uh, uh, I wanted to finish. I, I unless anyone else else has any questions, I wanted to ask one last one before we leave for today. Um, and I don't know why I'm starting to see sort of uh, comparisons between the contemporary what's happening right now versus what ha is happening you know, back then, because they're it's not the same story by far. But, you know, I think there's a lot of stories that are coming out. Um, so I was just wondering, uh, with the current crisis today, is there anything that we should learn from these heroic tales? Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting question. I do feel myself that the story is incredibly relevant. Does yeah. feel relevant? Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm kind of thinking in very, uh, things are beginning to I'm beginning to see things in a slightly different way so um, in England or Britain at the moment there's very much beginning to be a sense of kind of looking at the past and reinterpreting the past and looking at the stories that are untold in the past particularly with the Black Lives Matter movement right. and looking at the moment uh, there's a movement to look you know much more strongly at Britain's role in slavery for example which right. has been a, a, a part of history that we've tended not to look at and we've swept under the carpet and I think what this sort of teacher's story tells us is that this is a different way of looking at the world, uh, the, the looking at World War II, and it's a different way of looking at war. Mm -hmm. um, this was about collective action, not about individual heroes. It was about collective action. I think that's really important. It's about people coming together because they see that something is wrong and finding a strength in, in being together. Um, and it's also a story, you know, it's a story about non the power of non-violence. You know, um, this is not your usual war story. Um, right. Your usual war story has weapons and it has heroes, and it has goodies and baddies, and it has people winning very clearly. Right. Very much, you know, this is not, that's not in this story. That's, that's not really what life is like. It's complex, it's nuanced, it has all sorts of different levels. And I've just been very interested, really, increasingly, why stories like this one, particularly in film, have kind of remained, well, why have they remained untold? Why don't we tell those stories? These are, these seem to me the really important stories. If, and, you know, you said, does it have relevance today? Well, if we take the, um, uh, you know, the current COVID crisis, well, there's one way, sure as hell, we're going to get out of this. It's by working together right. as a society. We're not going to be saved by some individual. Right. There's not going to be some brilliant scientist who's going to come up with, lock his, uh, lock, himself away in a room and come up with some amazing cure if we're going to get out of this it's by realizing that we are a society that we work together collectively and in fact you can widen that in my view beyond covid you know you look at the other problems that we have the larger problem of um, climate change etc that we're facing you know we're going to do we're going to get out of this by working together not by individual heroes and and weapons <laughs> so i think the I think the story is, um, yeah, I do, yeah, I think it's a really important story. I do exactly. think it's a really important story. And of course, you know, it is a story about what is, after all, the most important thing, education. Right, right. Education is about futures. It's yeah. the most important thing. Well, well, thank you so much, John, and thank you, Eric, if you can hear us. Um, there is one last question. Um, Besides being able to see the film at scandinaviahouse.org right now, is there any other platform or website we can direct people to to see the film? Yeah, great. Thank you for asking that question. It's an important question. Um, basically, uh, the, the important website is theteachersprotest.com, theteachersprotest.com. You can find out all about the film there. You can also contact me directly through that website, and I'd love to hear people's thoughts and comments. As far as seeing the film is concerned, um, it's still on what's called theatrical release. And what that means is up to now, it's been shown in cinemas, etc. cetera. Um, uh, uh, we're moving now to more events like this online screenings. 
Um, it will be available on DVD, I suspect, in the near future and as a download in the near future. But also, um, you know, I, I mean, I know this is what you did, Carl. If, if you're interested in booking the film for your organisation or whatever, then you can get in contact with us and we can make the film available and we can organise a similar event with a question and answer um, for an organisation if, 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 you, if you'd like to do that. So, yeah, there's lots of ways that you can access the film. I missed a question. Uh, my apologies to Lori. Um, she is asking, are Norwegian children taught about the protest in school, especially those outside of Oslo? Before That's, I conclude. Yeah, that's a very good question. I don't, if I'm honest, I don't know the answer to that question directly. But I don't know if it's part of the Norwegian history curriculum. What I do know is that what was quite interesting, when we first made the film, uh, the, when we first started making the film, the, the, the idea was, okay, it's going to be, it would be good to make this film in English because it would be good for an international audience because Norway already, people in Norway already know this story. So there's therefore an audience, an international audience, and English is probably the best language to, for an international audience to access the film. Um, but as we were making the film and interviewing people, people were saying to me quite often, actually, you're saying and you think that the story is well known in Norway, but, but actually it's not that well known in, in Norway. Um, it's not as well known as you think. And so since the film has been shown a lot in Norway, and in fact, as I mentioned earlier, um, Education International uh, paid for it to be translated, and one of the languages it was translated into was Norwegian. Mm. So we have this really bizarre situation where you have a film where Norwegian people are being interviewed and speaking in English, who are then subtitled back into Norwegian. <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah, it's um, it, it, it is uh, it has been shown a lot in Norway. So. Oh, great. I'd like to jump in oh, and sorry. say that uh, it's my sense that it is not very well known in Norway. Uh, although it was going on tour and John showed it in Norway a number of times and there were a bunch of showings uh, scheduled for this year that were interrupted by COVID. I had the distinct honor of having lined up two showings at Eidsvall Lanskemnaz, the very school where my grandfather was a teacher when he was arrested in 1942. And I was very much looking forward to going back to that school and telling the story. But I think, you know, Norwegian schools have done some cool things about World War II. They had a program that I think is still going called Vita Busser, where it's the white buses. And if you guys know the story, the, the buses at the end of the war from 1945 were going down into Germany and going to different camps and getting prisoners and whisking them up to neutral Sweden. And uh, so the program for the Norwegian schools where uh, uh, late Gimnaz students uh, would get on a bus and they would drive into Germany and, and Poland and visit camps like Dachau and Sachsenhausen and uh, they would have survivors meet them while they were still, I, I, there's not very many left, but uh, my uncle was to accompany my uh, uh, cousin's daughter uh, when she was to do this tour, and then he had a health mishap, so he, he was unable to be a guide to go to Poland to go to Stutthof, which was a camp where he was. And uh, uh, anyway, that's a, a powerful program. But in terms of teachers' protest, uh, uh, I don't think it's very well known, and that's why the fact that John Seal made this film and somehow persevered to get it out there to the world is uh, remarkable, amazing, and uh, 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 just a fantastic thing. So uh, thank you, John, for bringing this forth. You. If you hadn't done it, I don't think anybody would have. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank well, you. thank you so much. And that, what a wonderful way to end this conversation today. Like I said, the film can still be in view at scandinavias.org until the 23rd, which is next Thursday. <laughs> Um, I did put the link in the chat box to the teachers' protests, and it does have contact information on that website as well. So if you want to contact John, uh, please do so from that website. Um, thank you so much, John. Thank you so much for thank Eric. You. Thank you for the, uh, the, the viewers for attending. Um, and I hope to see everyone soon in a virtual, not a virtual world, but a physical world. But we will continue to see each other in a virtual world as well. So thank you again. 
and goodbye. Thank you, Carl. Thanks so much for the opportunity uh, to show the film. It's been really great and to hear people's feedback. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.